Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Take Part. We are so excited for tonight's presentation um, about the 1910 St. John's Riot. Uh, I live in the St. John's neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, so this is very local history for me, and I just, I can't wait for this presentation. Uh, we are privileged to have three speakers with us this evening. We have Johanna Ogden, Pashara Singh Dillon and Navneet Kaur all with us this evening, and I will be introducing them as our event progresses tonight. Let me start by telling you just a little bit about Take Part. The mission of Take Part is to confront racism and to engage in dismantling the systems that perpetuate ingrained racial inequality. We do this through events, education, and outreach that foster engagement in building a community where all people are treated with equality and respect. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the presentations at Take Part events are those of the individuals. They don't necessarily reflect the opinions of Take Part or its members. Take Part affirms that the Portland area is the rightful homeland of the Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook peoples, Tualatin and Kalapuya, Malala, and the many other native people who live here, who have always lived here, and who have always belonged to and cared for this land. Take Part events are made possible in part by the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Portland and by contributions from individual donors like you. We work in, in partnership with the Association for Human Advancement and Development, and we are extremely grateful, grateful to all of you who contributed to this evening's event. Thank you so much. We're on Twitter now, <laughs> and you are welcome to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and then we post our videos on our YouTube channel, so please check us out in social media. We have a few communication ag agreements that we like to use for our events. First, listen, listen more, and keep listening even when you're uncomfortable. Engage tension, but do not indulge drama. The acronym WAIT, why am I talking? Consultation and collaboration, but not competition. Nobody has to win in a discussion. Maintain a safe space for difficult conversations and take away the lessons that we learned and the insights that we gained, but you can leave behind details like who said what. The way this evening will go is our attendees will remain muted until the Q&A portion. If you, if you think of a question that um, comes up during the presentation, you're welcome to use the chat box in order to put that into the presentation. When we do the q and I, I will be looking in the chat box for questions that you have for our presenters, so feel free to put them there. And then during the Q&A portion, you're welcome to raise your hand to ask a question, or you can also use the chat box to ask a question. And you will find the hand raise feature in the reaction button at the bottom of your screen. Please keep your comments and questions concise and respectful. Without further ado, Let's get into our presentation on the 1910 St. John's Riot and the fight for undivided Indian independence. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Joe Ogden. Joe is an independent Oregon historian and activist. In 2013, she initiated Astoria's Gather Party Centenary Commemoration and installation of its commemorative plaque. In March 2020, she, along with Navneet, Pashara, and many other activists, planned a commemoration of the St. John's Riot that was unfortunately derailed by COVID. She has spoken across the West Coast and in India. Her Oregon Historical Quarterly articles, Gather Historical Silences and Notions of Belonging, and White Right and Labor Organizing in Oregon's Hindu City won awards, and she is currently completing a book on the research. Thank you so much, Joe. First, thank yous for tonight's invitation, for Take Part's commitment to these questions, and to all of you for coming tonight. This maps a community of perhaps 500 Indian laborers who lived in Oregon from about 1905 to 14. They're overwhelmingly Sikh men, but also Hindus and Muslims, and together they formed the Gather Movement. Most left during World War I, and a community did not reemerge here until the 1970s. 
My job tonight is to provide some background and context to this very big story. And as mentioned, there are a couple more articles out there if you'd like some more information. I hope you'll leave tonight with a few big takeaways. So while the St. John's riot was a local event, its genesis and impact was regional and global and giants from the struggle for Indian independence and belonging lived and worked in this area. Also that the St. John's riot was an expression of white supremacy intrinsic to colonialism, including the settler colonialism we are inheritors of here in Oregon today. That different classes have differing stakes in white supremacy. And finally, that white supremacists don't necessarily back vigilante violence. Multiple authorities oppose this riot. Most of all, this is the rule for tonight. I need to make a quick, uh, few quick notes on language. We're using the word Indian, not for the sovereign indigenous nations and people of North America, but for the countries known as India and Pakistan after 1947. Most Oregon migrants were from Punjab, which was divided in 47 between India and Pakistan. Hindu at its best referred to the geographical place of Hindustan pre-1947, but mostly it was just a racial slur. Gather translates as mutiny or revolt and refers to the Indian anti-colonial independence party formed in Oregon in Astoria in 1913. When World War I broke out and in a tremendous act of agency, Indians left Oregon in the West and answered the other's call to fight British colonizers in India. 1910 St. John's was a booming town of 4,000 with a lot of new industries and all of that was spurred by the 1905 Lewis and Clark Fair. It was a town of immigrants, mostly from the American Midwest and some recent immigrants from Europe, yet foreigner was not applied to them. There were also perhaps 150 Indians living and working in St. John's with a smaller settlement across the river in Linton. In the years leading up to the riot, there was never a word about the Indian community in the town's week weekly newspaper, the St. John's Review. It pretty much talked about everything, but except for one small ominous article in 1907, you'd be hard pressed to know any Indians lived in St. John's. Yet after March 21st, the review became an overnight expert on all things anti hindu On March 21st, Gordon Dickey, a foreman at St. John's Lumber, discharged his crew early and headed to Condon's Saloon. A dust up between Dickey and some unnamed Indian men in Condon's moved into the streets. Suggesting premeditation, a mob of 200 quickly gathered and rampaged for the next two hours. From the downtown saloon, Dickey led the mob to a nearby Bitgood and Coal, where several Indians lived upstairs. They beat, robbed, and forced Indians onto the Portland trolley, and shop owner's son, Milton Unger, reportedly guarded them until they left. So this was their basic route when they left downtown. Next up was St. John's Lumber that employed many Indians, and like Dickey, John Kim, an Americanized name for Kanchi Ram, a later Gather Martyr, was a foreman at the mill. The mob ordered all the Indians to leave their jobs and town immediately. Next were Indians nearby homes. One man fled to City Hall, but in the presence of the mayor was dragged away by the mob. Another was pushed or jumped from a second story window. Indians were robbed at gunpoint of cash and anything else of value, their personal belongings strewn into the night. The Oregonian described windows broken, doors off hinges, bits of clothing scattered, and everywhere the evidence of riot and in a few cases bloodshed. Reportedly, all Indians had left town by the next morning. So that's the basic account of the riot, but does not the wise of it. So rumors were a big part of why it happened. In February, the Oregonian reported that an Indian was suspected of setting a fire to a St. John's factory, untrue. It was also rumored that St. John's Lumber Company was gonna hire more Indian laborers, probably true. But these local stories circulated coinciding to a spike in Indian migration to the US linked to a controversy within the San Francisco Immigration Agency. 
Exclusionists like the Asian Exclusion League howled about immigrant entries and newspapers across the West ran articles on the so-called Hindu invasion and tide of turbans. These currents shaped and ignited St. John's tempers with fears that whites were in danger. In turn, the riot in St. John's was widely reported on, adding more grist to the Western animosity mill. But here's a fact check on the supposed tide of turbans. In 1910, about 1 million migrants entered the US. 1,700 of them were from India. I found no evidence of explicit exclusionist organizing in St. John's but leaders of organized labor and overt exclusionist movements dovetailed in strategy and philosophy, and the labor newspapers of the day framed a pervasive anti-Asian message. The Portland Labor Press, or PLP, the city's leading labor newspaper, was no exception. The PLP did not simply express fears about Asians as competitors, but also constructed them as morally depraved with bits like this. Far more numerous were articles defining the PLP's racial boundaries of who were laborers to be organized and defended, boundaries that continue to haunt us. Intersecting with its consistent anti-Asian politics was the PLP's hostility towards the newly formed Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW, especially for recruiting non-white workers into its organization, unlike the mainstream labor movement. Radical St. John's resident and Gather leader Sohan Singh Bakna was an IWW member and speaker. So this political hurricane of national headlines, Western labor agitation, and local anxieties made landfall on March 21st, turning a routine Monday night in St. John's explosive. There's no question that laborers were a big part of events in St. John's and other such violent actions, but it was not just laborers participating or in support. The review believed that Indians' mere public presence threatened the town's prospects. Prominent citizens and authorities were involved in the riot. A doctor and unnamed others paid for the bail and legal defense of laborers later tried. For white workers, the animosities, I believe, were less about any wage or job competition. I found maybe a 10% wage differential between Indians and whites, and per the PLP, jobs were plentiful. More, it was a generalized threat about white right and privilege. Labor's fears and animosities were and are rooted in the racial hierarchy of colonialism that played out in global mills, mines, and factories. As Carmen Thompson writes, whites from Europe were the poorly paid shock troops for colonial settlement in North America. In exchange for their hardships, they were promised unprecedented democratic rights notably citizenship without owning property. This was not their status in Europe and in US and Canada, white men fought for and benefited from the greatest extension of democratic rights ever extended to commoners. Now, I don't mean in any way to imply that workers had easy lives because they absolutely did not, but that's a very complicated conversation for another time. By contrast, European colonial powers did not allow democratic rights in self rule in India or in other countries they dominated. Obviously, it's not as simple as this slide, but I think it does capture the basic dynamics. But there's some very significant wrinkles in this equation. First, Indians, brown skin, non-Christian, often turban, and from a colonized country, have been promised equal standing and the right to travel across the British Empire. England made this promise largely to quiet the significant Indian uprising in 1857. In other words, Indians came to North America with their own expectations, and they gained new expectations through witnessing North American laborers exercising their democratic rights. Secondly, North American industrials wanted and needed millions of laborers. Between 1850 and 1930, more humans traveled the world than at any previous time in history. In the North American West, workers were in the trenches of a labor system that formed the epicenter of the world's ethnic mixing. This massive movement of global people, so essential to industry, also threatened the promises and expectations of white settler society that that very same industry underwrote. 
But given the global power of white supremacy, instead of fighting as equals, white laborers and their organizations widely believed that if Indians and others were shut out, their position could be improved or safeguarded. For shop owners, businessmen, and city officials, it was perhaps less complicated. In a country and state founded on white supremacy, many believed that the mere public presence of Indians threatened their businesses and commercial future. The problem wasn't that Indians were working in the mills, but that they dared to occupy public space, whether in Condon Saloon, or as the uh, review described it, their parading in downtown streets. So these are the clash of expectations, promises, and economic realities playing out in the St. John's riot that shape white fears and Indian resistance. But back to the riot. Indians returned to St. John's the next day with the Multnomah County District Attorney and the support of the local British Council. The DA walked city streets with 190 warrants. Indians pointed out their attackers and a sheriff took people into custody. The warrants named many mill workers, city officials, and a review reporter. The review was aghast at the DA's actions and their aghastness continued throughout the trials. So the plan had been for the DA to serve the warrants. Suspects would then appear before a St. John's justice to determine if their charges merited review by Multnomah County's grand jury. Depending on the grand jury review, charges would either be dropped or set for trial in state court proceedings in Portland. But this plan quickly went awry. The DA was personally threatened with violence. St. John's uh, city officials refused to identify anyone or otherwise cooperate with the prosecutions. And tensions ratcheted up even more as British and US government agents came to town. For a supposedly local riot, there was a complicated set of actors involved. At the Indians' insistent, British Council Laidlaw lodged a complaint with the U.S. State Department. The State Department instructed the U.S. District Attorney's Office to assist with the local trial. U.S. Secret Service agents arrived to assist with the investigation. The British Consulate hired local attorneys to help with the prosecution. And within a week, all these people converged in the town. Indians had been through violence before. They were determined not to be forced out as they had been in Bellingham in 1907. So when they returned to St. John, some of them came armed because as John Kim or Kanchi Ram put it, we have no protection. The Warren hearings in the St. John's court were packed with supporters of the accused and with Indians. Hearings often went until midnight, they can be done Saturdays and all of this was to handle the many witnesses, the attorney fights, the translation, and the sheer volume of cases. But the big turning point came with the testimony of Mr. Ayers, the manager of St. John's Lumber. Judge Olson insulted Ayers for his defense of the Indians and accused the Indians of lying in their testimony. The DA declared the judge's remarks the final straw, and he ordered the investigation removed from the local court and assigned to the Multnomah County Grand Jury, a body with the power to compel testimony with the threat of jail. Indians responded with a prominent piece in the morning Oregonian penned by Taraknath Das, an important Northwest radical that tactfully called out racism and stated Indians' former high regard for America as the land of liberty stood in the breach of this trial. For weeks, the grand jury interviewed 100 people of all nationalities and reviewed the warrants in local court cases. Newspapers speculated on the release date of its findings. Finally, on April 27th, the Morning Oregonian announced the felony indictments against the mayor, five policemen, Milton Unger, Gordon Dickey, and five other laborers. The first trial was Dickey's in June of 1910, but after two weeks and five hours of jury deliberation, he was convicted. Dickey petitioned for and won a new trial. In January 1912, he was convicted again and sentenced to five years for felony riot, but his entire sentence was suspended. Dickey's half-brother was similarly treated. Charges against the police were dropped. According to the Oregonian, the mayor's charges were dropped on March 6th of 1912, and he promptly petitioned the St. John City Council to pay his legal fees, which on a split vote, they agreed to do. 
and the trials were finally totally completed in 1912, a full two years after the riot. For everyone, however, the repercussions echoed long and far. So two important questions emerged for me. While justice in St. John's was woefully inadequate, the fact that there were trials was notable. No 1907 riot, which were larger, were prosecuted, but this does not mean Oregon was a racial mecca. Instead, Portland leaders had developed a particular racial policy beginning with Chinese migrants in the late 1800s. They wanted to develop their state, but laborers were in short supply. Powerful men calculated that if they opposed mob violence, they could attract and keep laborers driven out by pogroms elsewhere. And it worked. Portland's Chinatown swelled after the 1885 Tacoma riot, and Punjabi migration grew after 1907 riots in BC and Washington. These leaders did not intend for Asian workers to permanently take up residence or to have power. Towards that end, they restricted marriage, property ownership, denied citizenship, and the vote. And I think this is what was fought out between Portland and St. John's city officials in 1910 that mob violence jeopardized the building of the region. The outcome of the cases also reveals the policy's ultimate loyalties. Authorities were unwilling to convict officials or jail rioters over issues of race and the matter was declared closed. Council Laidlaw served his government by trying to mollify its subjects given the radicalism that was on the rise in the community. The British sought to be seen as the protector of Indians in St. John's. But as Bucknod later wrote, Laidlaw did not do anything meaningful. Shortly after the close of the trial, Indians in St. John's began organizing to overthrow British rule of India. This slide gives you a sense of some of the leaders in St. John's. But how and why would a local riot prompt organizing and then leaving to end British rule of India? In short, Indians connected colonialism's dots between their subjugation in India and their second-class status in North America. And while they suffered no fools in St. John's, Indians' focus was not against white workers. Further, although they utilized the justice system, their essential focus was not on greater rights in America. As Bakna put it, the St. John's attack was a wake-up call and a game changer for all Indians. Workers took the slavery curse to their hearts for the first time. Indians came to understand that obtaining the rights to rule and be citizens of their own country, rights globally reserved for whites were crucial. And without such powers, they would always be considered black thieves everywhere, as a later Gother poem put it. In the spring of 1912, nearly simultaneous to the close of the St. John riot trials, they organized a new group called the Pacific Coast Hindi Association. They met in Kanchi Ram's rented house, elected Bakna, Ram, and Kumar as leaders, and a second chapter was established in Astoria headed by Kesar Singh. These became the organizing nucleus for Gather, which was formally launched in Astoria in 1913. And this is a map of the meetings leading up to Astoria's founding all along the river. Prominent activists from across the West attended the founding, gather, gathered recruits from around the world, primarily through the distribution of its newspaper. With World War I, several thousand recruits returned to India to overthrow British rule. No one in Condon Saloon in March 1910 could have imagined where the robbing, beating, and expulsion of Indians might have ended. The rising rested tide of the entire community, the product of every injustice suffered from India to the North American West was channeled into its collective response. Far from just a local riot in a small upstart town, St. John's illustrates that local racism can indeed have global ramifications. And now you have the real pleasure of hearing from two friends and co-collaborators in resurfacing and promoting this history, Bashar and Navneet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Joe. That was amazing. It is my terrific pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Pashara Singh Dillon is an 82-year-old Punjabi poet, singer, and activist based in the Central Valley, California. 
raised in the household of Gother Party President Sohan Singh Bakana back in Punjab, India, he is now a retired landscape architect trained by the Landscape Institute London. Despite living and working halfway around the world, he is a poet at heart, writing and singing in Punjabi about a variety of social issues ranging from human rights and gender equality to the environment and Sikh philosophy. His latest collection of poetry, Diva Bale Sumandaron Par, The Lamp Still Burns Across the Sea, and album Awaz Te Parvaz, is available from his website. Pashar, we're so glad you're here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I think through this pandemic, I'm glad we are safe and we are all here. But let me begin by thanking Dr. Donna Stewart take part in the Portland anti-racism team and all the others for organizing this incredible event. The impact of St. John's racist attack on British Indian workers as echoed by Johanna Ogden's research comes down to a sense of national identity. This deeply wounded their soul, hurt their pride, shamed their nationality and spurred a diasporic national movement to regain control of their country. So this riot raised their anguish not so much towards the white American worker who rioted against them, it harnessed the anger towards the British occupiers instead. This anti-Indian sentiment that exploded in St. John's literally sowed the seeds of radical gather movement that contributed to the fall of the British Raj. Having been raised in the household of Son Singh Pagna, founding president of the Gadar party who played a leading role in the historic movement, this talk is very emotional for me. I wish the Gadarites could look down from wherever they are and see how far it has come to honor them and their legacy. On their behalf, I express my gratitude towards all Oregonians, especially those who have enabled this history to come alive. Every nation has a history and a story of its brave people who stood up against oppression sacrificing everything they held dear. In this case, the Gadarites not only stood up and fought for liberation from British colonial rule in India, but also fought for the innate rights of immigrant workers in America, sporting equal rights for all. Led by Sun Singh Pagna, most returned home in 1914, as Jahanam mentioned, and died fighting for the independence of India. Sun Singh was arrested and was sentenced to death in the first Lahore conspiracy case in 1915, which was later commuted to life imprisonment in faraway islands referred to as Kalapani. For many historians, the story of Indian independence ends on the night the British cruelly and officially quit India with a haphazard collection of names mentioned, leading to India being divided into Pakistan. To start piecing together the full story of Indian independence, it is important to recognize the achievements of all who participated, especially whose names and contributions by and large are unknown, ignored, or forgotten, as it appears to have happened with the Gadar party. Explained in Son Singh's words, when these surviving patriots or Desh Pakistan in Punjabi met the Congress leaders in Delhi and congratulated Jawaharlal Nehru as the first Prime Minister of Independent India in the 1950s, Baba Pagna said this, Pandaji, you are talking about rejoicing the freedom of India we are talking about the freedom of Indians and the emblem of independent, independent struggle that your Congress party has solely wrapped around its own headgear is not true. Gadar party and others made a lot of sacrifices also. Although Nehru had a great respect for Gadri Babas and tried to initiate programs in that direction also, but it didn't go much further. The successful, the, the successful Indian government paid only lip service. In 2013, however, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh officially recognized their importance in his inaugural speech at Parvati uh, and at uh, Pravasi Bharti Devas in Kochi. He also made the decision to upgrade the Gadar Memorial in San Francisco into a functional museum and library with a sculpture to honor the Gadri heroes. Thanks largely to Johanna Ogden's research article, the city council and the mayor of Astoria hosted a centennial commemoration in 2013, which I was honored to be able to attend. 
they passed the proclamation and installed a permanent plaque next to the original site of the Finnish Socialist Hall in Astoria, where the meeting took place. On my return to California, we began a small movement for more recognition, gaining the support of many city councils and mayors who also took a similar stand. It made through to the US Congress who also passed a similar resolution. The year 2013 was a phenomenal year. Thankfully, other steps have continued, such as the Indian Consulate in San Francisco began holding celebrations there. The next milestone in the right direction uh, to commemorate Gadarites would be to dedicate a day in their honor so it can be studied and celebrated as a national holiday. This would allow all descendants of the diasporic Indian community, including descendants of Gadarites, to come together. The Gadar movement conceived in St. John's in 1910 born and cradled in Astoria 1913 and nurtured in California is a story that needs to be told to more people from a human interest perspective, especially when the few people who know the history don't know that all these places played an important role. It's a story that deserves to be told in school history books, both in the Indian subcontinent and America. I am happy that curriculum for history social science framework for California public schools, as well as for post-secondary education, new textbooks published in 2018 have been updated covering South Asian history for all. They include Punjabi immigrants for the first time and are available for viewing in Fresno where I live. I am proud to be a part of this inclusivity effort. As someone raised in the house of Son Singh Sagna until my early 20s, there is another side to this fascinating story, which is beyond the narrative of these heroic men who fought tirelessly and selflessly. There is the story of the women and children they had left behind thousands of miles away, which does not appear to have been adequately covered in published interviews or written biographies. Babaji's wife, Bishankar, for instance, was left alone in Pagna most of her married life. Both Son Singh and Bishankar were two revolutionaries fighting on two different fronts. While Son Singh was fighting on the front lines of the Gadar Party against British rule, his wife, Bishankar, was the one who facilitated Son Singh to stand his ground by taking over his family responsibilities and obligations in addition to her own. They say there is always a great woman behind every great man. Bishankar, Bishankar was one such woman behind Son Singh. By the time I came to, with, with, uh, to live with them in Fakna in 1947, the British had quit India, a dream turned bittersweet, country was partitioned, and me and my family were forced to leave our ancestral lands that now fell in the newly formed country of Pakistan. I was five or six years old when we crossed the border to Indian side and a new life began for me in village Pagna. Arrested in the prime of his youth and released after 21 years of rigorous imprisonment and eight hunger strikes, Babaji was now an old man. I still remember his stories of the first time he returned home with white hair, he reached his village Pagna but he could not find the way to his house. A lot of water had gone under the bridge by then. His grandmother had died a long time ago. Ram Kaur, his mother by birth, and his faith mother, Har Kaur, both passed away one after the other, tracing paths with weary eyes, waiting for the return of their only son every day. Son Singh found his wife, Bishan Kaur, now also with white hair, as a lone survivor waiting for his return all these years, standing inside a half dilapidated house in Patna. Resolving with her husband's life commitment to the freedom struggle early on, when he was still in America, Bishankar also made a resolve. Without complaint, she had spent all her younger years in Son Singh's absence, keeping the door open and caring for his elderly parents, shuffling between villages Patna and her brother's house in Jandiala, 20 miles away in Lahore. Vishankar epitomized courage, humility, unshakable faith, and character. Everyone in the village called her Mataji, meaning a respected mother. Now in their sunset days, when someone came to see Babaji and as a mark of respect intended to touch his feet, he would step back humbly and uh, pointing to his wife, he would say, gentle one, before me it is her sacrifice. You may touch her feet if you must. Uh, someone's feet, she would end. Vishankar was the elder sister of my grandfather, Jeon Singh Jandiala, who helped her keep up with her obligations by reaching out from Jandiala time to time while her husband was in jail. 
as the country became independent and became divided at the same time during 1947 partition, her ancestral home fell to Pakistan. The quirk of fate, fate now turned the tables on them and brought my grandfather's family at his sister's doorstep in Patna. That is how I came to live with them as a child. I called her Vade Puvaji, meaning senior aunt after my father, but I called Son Singh Babaji, meaning grandfather. As I grew older, I remember wondering what Mission Corps would think about this independence her husband had been fighting for all his life. Independence that partitioned India, independence which made her brothers helpless refugees, narrowly escaping death and being kicked out of their ancestral place for generations. I can imagine Babaji saying that God rights were not in favor of the partition of India in the first place, and not least in the favor of forced migration that came to be known as the largest and the bloodiest forced migration of populations in history, which resulted in a worse bloodbath on both sides. Babaji would say, if Gadrites had won the day, there would have been no partition. It would have been the United States of India. The greater irony for my grandfather, more than losing his own home in Lahore, was <clears throat> taking shelter in his sister's house. When he was the one who helped her, for all those years her husband was put away for life in the hellish jails in Kalapani. The quirk of, the, uh, of fate brought them at her doorstep seeking shelter. It was now her turn to help them out. Bishankar was a simple lady of an unshakable faith. She had piercing blue eyes even in her old age. She walked with a cane as she broke her, leg, her right leg falling from her horse while shuffling between Pakna and her brother's home years ago. But she was very upbeat and humorous even in her old age and would tell us amusing stories. She would tell us while riding to her brother's house to Jandiala, 15, 20 miles away, she would tie her white head, head cover, the pata, around her head like a turban and carried a big stick to look like a warrior riding a horse, not a lone woman. But where uh, my grandfather's family arrived and Bishankar and Babaji now lived, was not the same ancestral house in the village my grandfather had been helping her to keep standing. That house was now repaired and donated to the village school for girls. This place was Kirtik San Ashram he built on his farmland, where he came out of the jail in 1930 to house the orphaned children of martyred revolutionaries. This spacious accommodation was now lying vacant, waiting for, for perhaps for new refugees to arrive. And that brings us to another equally important point overlooked about Gadarites. Despite their image as iron men with nerves of steel, these revolutionaries were passionate about things that tugged at their heart rings too. They were lovers of art and literature and poets at heart. Son Singh Bhakna, for example, was a staunch defender of education, in particular the education of girls, which was an issue very close to his heart. Way ahead of, of his time, ensuring health and quality education for the younger generations is where he felt the society building and real political power resided. Playing an active part in to make, make a difference, helping the deliberately left behind and silence, spreading awareness as an activist was, uh, activist was what he did for the rest of his life. Since his personal debt, debt was still standing as the hard earned dollars in American sawmills of Oregon did not work for him to clear the personal debt as he originally intended, something else did, which proved a blessing in disguise. Land rates had increased many fold in all these years. So I think managed to get most of his land back from the money lenders by consolidating debt on a small portion. He had already started a school for girls donating his ancestral home in the village. He then built the Kirtik San Ashram to help the orphaned children of martyr revolutionary um, in education. To do this, he donated a portion of eight acres of his fertile land and moved to live with them with his wife by building a simple but spacious homestead and named it Kirtik San Ashram in his field. With the help of Desh Bhagat Parwar Sahai Committee of which he was general secretary. Five girls and seven boys of mixed ages were brought there and began to teach and learn about progressive farming. An irrigation well was made ready for irrigation and started to produce quality fruit and vegetables. The children became so motivated and the experiment in cooperative farming became so successful and popular in the area that at one stage experts from the government agriculture research farm Gurdaspur came to visit Kirtik San Ashram and learn from their achievements. 
No wonder it caught the attention of the British CID, who thought something was indoctrinating anti-British sentiment in youth. So they arrested him a couple of times for six months each time under one pretense or other. But the young farmers kept going until 1940 when Babaji was arrested again and kept under the Deoli camps for three long years. This time the prolonged absence broke the children's hearts and the entire plantation on the farm got destroyed. All children were taken away at the, and the Kirtik San Ashram became deserted until my family arrived and sought shelter seven years later in 1947. In those days, simple settlements outside the village in farmland were called deras and not known by the modern term farmhouse. So the people simply called Kirtik San Ashram Babira Dera. Since the rehabilitation of my grandfather's family took time, the family stayed at Babira Dera longer than expected. Good thing was that I grew up in Patna in Babaji's company. I attended the same primary school which Babaji had attended 70 years before me and graduated from Janta High School Patna for boys and girls, which Babaji also later built in 1952 by donating more of his land. Although I came to live with them in their sunset days after they had weathered all those mighty storms brewed in their lives, but I watched them how they lived now. I had the opportunity to hear many of the stories of yesteryears from horse's mouth, so to speak, but I was not able to fully comprehend being so young until much later. Babaji was nearing 80 years of age and I remember slim built old man when he was arrested again in 1948. It was his own Indian government this time who put him in Yol camp in Tarnsala, protesting the bad behavior of the jail staff and the worst food given to prison inmates he sat on his ninth and last hunger strike, which bent his back forever. One wonders whether this arrest was made based on those diaries that British intelligence personnel might have left behind by accident or by design so that the new Indian government keep harassing these patriots, punish them for their patriotism. As I came to know later, it was with Pandit Nehru's personal intervention that finally got him out of the imprisonment cycle. But the damage was already done. The proud head that he always held high and the mighty British Empire failed to bend in 26 years of draconian jail, his own Indian government succeeded in doing in a matter of weeks at Yaw, to which he would jokingly say it was a stamp of his own government on his back for him to carry. Since I was his nephew's son and I called him Babaji, classmates in school called me Babida Pota, meaning his grandson. Babaji became a major influence in my life, although I did not know him then other than a grandfather figure. But as I grew older, it became to reflect and I began to understand what they stood for. I also learned about their disappointments with their own government after independence. I received my life less lessons and learned of literacy, literary influence there. And it is perhaps largely because of Babaji that I am a poet and a singer. Before children started, spending their free time watching cable television and playing video games, there was magic. And for me, that magic was poetry. In the evenings, along with Babaji, my cousins and children from the neighboring villages, we would we would all join in an open air courtyard at Babi the Dera. We would take turns reciting and singing poems from the progressive newspaper cuttings and magazines like Preet Larry, which published finely po polished uh, prose and poetry about social issues. Most magazines care are still afraid to touch today. Creating tunes on the spot was something that came very easily to me. And I would always try to convey the emotion put into the poems penned down by Gadri poets, sometimes under assumed names. I also read from other famous poets such as Amrita Preetan, Professor Mohan Singh, and many Gadri poets that I was singing. Someone once said, we are born as poets from a wound that is inflicted upon us by other poets' poetry. And at some point I had that wound. But who would have imagined then that one day I would be singing my own written poetry and that too at the very places in America where Babaji had been and Gadarites themselves wrote and sang places such as the Yugantar uh, Ashram in San Francisco, Stockton, Gurdwara, California, Bellingham in Washington, or Astoria in Oregon where it all began more than a century ago. I am honored and humbled to be a part of this great talk, tracking their footsteps and sharing my thoughts that I dedicate to the spirit of all Gadri Babas who were not just revolutionaries on the outside, but had an equal resolve within. 
I can see with my mind's eye Baba Ji walking about with his bent back, wearing milk white clothes, and Bishan Kaur with a limp walking with a cane back home. Baba Ji left us at the age of 98 in 1968, and Bishan Kaur passed away peacefully in his arms a few years before. Knowing him as revolutionary of revolutionaries and patriot through and through, I assume no one dared ask Babaji how he would like to be remembered, like one normally asks other great people during interviews. But uh, giving you an example, I would leave you with a message he conveyed to all young men and women at uh, the Gadar Party Golden Jubilee that was published in Desh Bhakti Yadda in 1964. Translated in English, Son Singh said something like this. Desh Bhakti or patriotism is that devotion and spiritual attachment. If you have it, you forget all about your personal comforts and conveniences. And like a true lover, you are ever ready to sacrifice your all for your true love, your country. You do not care about temptation, fame, or even the fear of death. All these temptations vanish in the service of mankind. Babaji posed a question. May I know if you are doing your present job sincerely as a patriot? If your reply is yes, I feel motherland should be proud of you. But if not, you are letting down yourself and your motherland both. I call upon you to live like self-respecting, responsible citizens of a free country wherever you live. The Gadarite story is certainly a fascinating part of Oregon history, American history, and an important part of South Asian American history that is relevant to us all, especially Punjabi immigrants today, because of the recently uh, recent election and the regime change going on in Punjab. It may be a mere coincidence, but as we are talking here, the incoming Amarni Party new government, supported by all sections of Punjabis with the unprecedented majority, have ousted the apparently corrupt political clique, dubbed as Kali Angres or Black Englishmen, ruling Punjab since independence. During the swearing in ceremony the other day, the new Chief Minister Pagwantaman raised the same slogan in clubs in the Abad, vowing social and economic equality for all, slogan used by Gadarites and Shaheed Azam Pagat Singh while ousting the British. Time will tell how far this inclab goes this time. But the Gadarites' unfulfilled dream appears to have re emerged in Punjab and is on the march again. Thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you so much, Pashara. Um, I'm I am incredibly moved. Um, Thank you. And, and as I expect many in our audience are. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end, but we have one more speaker. So it is my terrific pleasure to introduce Navneet Kaur. Navneet was born in Punjab, is a multilingual college educator and community activist in Salem. She translated for and organized support for immigrants unlawfully detained in the Sheridan Federal Prison, has been active in Black Lives Matter, worked on inclusive curriculum for Oregon secondary schools, and has done other equity projects and movements. Navni, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you so much for um, the awesome introduction here. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so. I just want to share like what my reaction, my experience um, of when I learned about this uh, rich history on, in this part of um, Oregon, of America. We'd heard in the passing about Gatherites being in California, in, in Stockton, in San Francisco, but we'd never known about this part of the history. That I came to know when I came to U.S. And I met with Johanna and translated a little bit for her when she was doing her, um, her research. And, you know, when we were growing up, the uh, studying pre and post uh, partition history, the repeatedly coming up names were those of Gandhi, Nehru, Shastri, Lala Lajpat Rai, or Bhagat Singh. Um, and these, though, uh, names in passing, you know, there was mentioning of Son Singh Pakna, um, but his contributions and those of the other, the contributions of the other good rights like him were so much underplayed. Um, I now know, because now I've read history, 
the history that was written and made in this part of the country and know of their contributions. Uh, and, and when you try to tell of this part of history to even to like, I, I had visitors um, about three years ago from, or four years ago from India, uh, two of these women, my close relatives and veteran history teachers. And I talked about extensively about this history, this part of history that we came to know about here and even took them to Astoria. You know, you, sh you saw the plaque that Joanna displayed during her presentation showed them that plaque, you know, and, and talked about, about um, all those, showed him, heard them the historical buildings. They were in disbelief. They were like, um, are you sure? If this were true, we would have known. We've taught history all our lives. You know, it was, it's, it's hard to even like talk to people in education about this part of history that is so much underplayed. I think the one parallel that you can draw is be between the contributions of MLK Jr. and those of the, you know, I should say the widely known contributions of MLK Jr. to the civil rights movement, to the lesser known con contributions of, say, figures like Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, and other, many others who had given their lives for this movement of, of social justice. And, and you know, when you visit history or revisit history, some of the current um, history that ties in so closely with it, as, um, you know, uh, Donna mentioned my, my um, involvement with the, I should say, the um, immigrant, uh, immigrants in, or the, detainees in Sheridan prison. Um, I think that, that another parallel that you can draw, the, the reason that I got involved in that, that, that project was that I saw such mistreatment of them, you know, in prison, you know, when they were thrown in prison with, with criminals, you know, murderers. And, and I saw the way they were treated there and the, the situation that they were kept in, I was, beyond moved, you know. Um, so I think the, when, when I think about that and I think about the mistreatment given to the, in quotes, you know, the dirty Hindus, you know, where is the difference, you know? I see the same mistreatment, same atrocities um, that these men and women in, and other immigrants are, are being subjected to. I think the ideology that I feel so revolted against that is so evident right here is that you, you're you welcome to come and work for us, but don't you try to belong here. And that's something that, that's really hard. And I'm sorry, I'm a mess here. I think that that's one, one thing that when we visit histories like that, I think that's one thing that to to keep in mind, to to keep reminding ourselves of, of these things because we don't, I think the reason that we visit and revisit history is so that we don't repeat it. So I just wish that we all can, can remember that these men and women are here for a reason. And those reasons, some of those reasons you heard from Johanna, some of those reasons you heard from Bishara and similar, and, and I'm so glad, Bishara, that you mentioned the current situation of politics in the end. I'm so glad that you did that because there are reasons that people leave their homes to migrate to other countries. And we need to remember those reasons. I promised Pishara and Johanna that I'll keep this short, so I cut it down um, pretty to about seven, eight minutes. I don't know if it even fulfilled what you guys uh, asked of me, but that's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you so much, Navneet. Thank you so much to all three of our speakers. Uh, we will move to our uh, question and answer portion. 
So um, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question live, or you can put your question in the chat and I will send them on to our speakers. Um, okay, uh, Adrian and Bernadette, would you like to ask your question? Yes, and before I do, I just want to remind people that the chat can be saved. You can go to the three little dots at the bottom and click on it, and the saved chat will appear after the end of the with all the links in it. Uh, my question is for Navneet. I have sadly noticed that there continues to be uh, anti-East uh, Indian uh, sentiment, especially against tech workers and others uh, that is going on. And I'm wondering if you uh, can address that as well. Navneet, would you like to address that? Yes, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I probably missed that part. Exactly what I mentioned, you know, uh, towards the end that, you know, you're welcome to work for us, you know, you can come here. H1 visas, the abundance of H1 visas are, are ev an evidence of that, you know, H1, H2. But you dare not ask for a right to, to be a part of the larger community, you know. For example, you, a few years ago, I think it was um, four or five years ago, um, two men were having the evening drinks in Nevada and one was killed um, because supposedly he wasn't legal here and he was working for a very high, a very, a very huge company, I think tech company there. Um, and was uh, came to the U.S. Uh, for on an H-1 visa too. You know that I I don't know. You know we never know why these things happen. You know, and we do know why these things happen. Of course, we do know. But but how do we address that by doing? I think what we are doing right now. Uh, one of those things that we can we can do and then keep educating people. But I sincerely, if you ask, ask me, uh, if I talk from my heart, I don't know if it's ever gonna go away. It's never gonna end. Thank you, I understand that very well. Um, did, did, you, was, did I even answer your question? Yes, you did. You did, because what I see is that nothing has changed, that on an employment basis, people are still being attacked. Um, I think Carla, Carla, thank you so much, uh, wants me to talk about what brought these Indians to St. John's initially. And I think Pashara Singh did touch on that, like it was because the British were ruling India. And I think Johanna would be the right person to answer that. but. From my experience of being an Indian, and um, I think that that British, it was the you know the empire, <laughs> the Raj in India, and these freedom fighters because they wanted to be free of the British rule, uh, could not gather because they would put you know uh, limits on how many people can gather, at what time, and if they can or cannot gather. And, and one big example of, of, of or should, say, should I say, uh, the example of the repercussions of gathering was, would be to mention the Jallianwala Bagh, where people gathered an occasion um, to celebrate it. And they were, and, and of course, to talk about freedom and all that. Um, they were shot at. and. Mm -hmm. All of them, all of them were shot at, including the children, including little children. And they, I should say most of them died. Most of them, them were killed in that shooting. And you can read Jallianwala Bagh. I can 
if somebody could put it in the chat. Um, Joe, would you be kind enough to put it in the chat, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre? Um, and the Gen General, uh, General Dyer um, was the one who uh, gave orders of um, shooting them. So when these things happened and they knew that they could not gather and they could not organize, they tried to leave India, went to different countries, uh, gathered there to organize against such rules, such uh, against the British to, to be free of their rule. And the reason they were they ended up in Oregon was Joe, do you want to talk about the um, white only in Canada and the uh, the riots in Bellingham riots that led them to Oregon? Sure. And and just to add to what you're saying, um, I think you're highlighting both the violence that was going on in India under British rule. And they basically drained the country for over 200 years. London was the wealthiest country in Europe, and most of that came from India. They've gone from a self-sufficient country in food and other products to basically the Brits just sucked it all out and took it and didn't care if they left famines behind, you know. So that was a lot of what was behind people wanting and needing to leave was um, for those kinds of conditions. And just on that last question, too, and again to push off of what Navneet was saying is yes, the thing about you can come and work, but don't think about staying and feeling like you have a place. But I also, for me, it goes back to looking at this country as a white settler country. And so there's this ongoing theme of pollution just by the mere fact, if this is a white settler country, other people being here drags it down by definition. And that manifests, I think, culturally and politically in a lot of as we all know, a lot of very ugly ways. So, so I think, um, Nami, you were, you were saying about the, the regional violence that was going on across in, from British Columbia all the way down to the Mexican border on the West Coast. And a lot of that in the Pacific Northwest was aimed at Indians. And Oregon was about the only place that there were, wasn't in 1907, these big communal outbreaks of violence. There was a murder in Boring, Oregon, another whole topic I'll talk about another time. But um, so Oregon started looking really attractive <laughs> because they, you know, there weren't big outbreaks of violence going on. And secondly, largely because of the 1905 Lewis and Clark Fair, there was work. And after the riots in Washington and British Columbia, Indians got locked out of working for, I mean, they were locked out of timber for until um, after the war, First World War, I think. So that combination of no communal violence, there was personal violence, but not communal collective cities exploding. Um, and there was work. And so that's another reason that the St. John's riot was so, such a hit on the heart and psyche of people. It was like, we thought this might have been a safe place and a possibility. And well, that just blew up in our face. So did I get it, Navneet? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think what I wanted to put in the chat is that when I talk about um, these, uh, the Jallianwala Bagh or the current violence, I think I am so emotionally involved in it that I talk for, from every angle and then I'm kind of mushed up situation in front of you. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, Nizi, um, I think uh, part of um, uh, Carla, Carla asked that question. Sorry? Who, who, who asked the question, Carla? Carla. No, she what, has to clarify. What was the name of the, uh, who asked the question? That was Carla. Carla, I think uh, the, in the part of the uh, the answer that why those people are here in the first place um, uh, at that time is more or less uh, the same as it is now. In the early 20th century, uh, there was a great depression, and uh, the uh, the British government uh, brought uh, 
terrible agricultural laws. The similar laws as the, this go, Indian government brought. And the farming, uh, Punjab is a, basically a, you know, a, a, a agricultural country. And the farming became uh, such a, um, uh, you know, terrible business that the people were just uh, abandoning their, their farms and the money lenders were getting in. Probably that was the, uh, uh, the British policy to get the, because they needed uh, the, the people for the war. Uh, so they needed most of the people uh, to get out of their, their profession anyhow. So it was a double thing uh, in the, during the depression, they brought those uh, agricultural laws and they increased the, the revenue and all that kind of thing uh, that made more people to leave their job. And in case of Son Singh Pagna, all his land, it was mortgaged uh, money lender. And that was one typical case. And those people came here uh, temporarily uh, because, you know, they had heard about uh, the, the new world, America, that is such a democratic country and equal rights and all that kind of thing. And the people had uh, heard uh, wonderful stories about this new world. And that is how they came. And they wanted to work here for a few years and go back and uh, get their land back from the money lender. But this is what happened uh, with the, with the, with Son Singh, that instead of uh, getting his land back, you know, they had him in the jail all his time. Thank you for clarifying. Questions? I have one for the audience if there isn't. Did people know about this riot? I did, but mostly because I live in this specific neighborhood. Um, and it, and only because neighborhood history enthusiasts once in a while will mention it. That's the only reason I knew about it at all. And I, I don't have the impression that this history is very widely known. And I certainly had no idea of the connection to the Gather movement and everything that happened in India after that. Uh, so this is, this is all a revelation for me. So Human has a question. If one, if one compares Canada to the United States, Indians are more represented in Canadian government and cabinet. What might be the reason? That's an interesting question. It's not like we don't have any Indians here. Yeah. Pamela. <laughs> Do any of our presenters want to take a stab at that? I mean, we still, we have Indians here in, I mean, yes, definitely uh, more Indians in the administration, in the government, et cetera. But I think there are more Indians in Canada than there, there are here. That's what I think. But um, again, you know, we can't forget. We, we, we shouldn't forget, even though that um, Indians have prospered and progressed and been like part of this fiber that we call this, um, the, the, not the fiber, but the fabric that we call America. I know personally, from my experience, can tell you that you have to fight for everything. You have to be three times better than your white counterpart to be accepted into anything like that. I have, as even a college teacher, I have not been able to be a full-time professor, even though I have better qualification, more, more experience, but to talk of, uh, being a part of of the uh, the the government, you know, so I think that must must be remembered at all times. Thank you, Donna. I see that Jessica had her hand up a couple times. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank uh, all three of the presenters. My goodness, this really needs to be taught. We need to know about it and people do not know about it. Navneet, of course, is correct. 
something kept coming to me, and this is for uh, Pashara. Am I saying it right? Yeah. Um, do you think that Babaji would be proud of the Russian news editor, the woman editor, oh, God. who stood behind the anchor with a handwritten sign mm -hmm. that said, you're being lied to about Ukraine, you know, and um, other things to try to uh, to correct what's going on in uh, with the Russian people right now about this war and this assault on Ukraine. And I mean, all I could think of was she gave everything. She's been arrested. Who knows what will happen to her? Isn't that what, what Babaji was saying? If you, you have to be all in, if you're going to stand up for it, what do you think? Is he there? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm a poet and a singer. I'm not a politician. <laughs> 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 I I think I will be the not the right person. Maybe Joe can answer that. But uh, it's a very good question. From from what I from what I know, uh, what you said, Pishara, about him being so passionate about educating women and bringing them to to the you know to equal to same level. I think he would be very proud. Right? That's just my guess. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, uh, yes. I mean, uh, probably I didn't follow the question properly. Of course, I will be very proud of that. <laughs> okay, and uh, we have another question from Adrian and Bernadette. Have Indians continued to live here for a hundred years or have they been going back and forth between the United States and India? I'll take I'll take that one. So I think one of the points that's really interesting about this history is I think it was mainly because of the influence of Gather in the state that the Indian community has been a discontinuous community here. So mm -hmm. basically after, when World War I broke out and you know England and Germany entered it before the US did, Gather put out the call to return to India and its ties were so significant in the state that the state basically cleared out of Indians because they went back to fight. And those that didn't go basically went elsewhere to find a community, usually California or British Columbia. So that's what I was trying to say. It's a, and a community did not reemerge here until the 1970s and with a sick community, Nadine and Pashar can probably correct me on this, but it was especially after 1984. But in Oregon, it's largely been a discontinuous community. And I think that's because of the Gather's influence here, which is kind of amazing because, you know, when I started this research, I thought I was going to find some horrible, ugly crime. Not that I didn't, there are those, but mainly what injured emptied the state is their own action, their own revolutionary agency, which I find it's like mind blowing. Is that? Donna, you might have two hands up. We have Grace Growing Medicine and Jane Leininger. Okay, um, let's start with Grace. Would you like to? Yeah. I'm not going to show myself because it's too late. <laughs> However, um, I, my question is, um, the Native American people, also called Indians, <laughs> there it is, we got hit by that uh, racist white people. And then uh, the black people got hit in this country in particular. And so I'm thinking, how, do the do the the true Indians, the Sikhs, particularly. What do you do? You know of uh, of any uh, support that you got from Black people and Native American people at the time that you guys were going through racist uh, stuff like this? Nadine or Pashar, do you want the? Okay, here I go then. <laughs> uh huh. The history, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, it, just real briefly. Um, 
the early 1900s up through and slightly past the First World War were times of a lot of nationalist upsurge all over the world. And Indians made community there. The reason they held their founding in the Finnish Socialist Hall was, you know, the Finns were fighting the Russians. You know, they had a lot of close relations with the Irish. There was the Irish Rebellion, I think, in 1912. There were parts of um, members of Gather that worked very closely with Mexican, um, you know, and the struggle that was going on in Mexico at the time. They even, there for a while, amongst Gadris, there was an idea to go train in Mexico with the people that were fighting down there to get practice before they went to India. They, you know, the Chinese, the early rebellion, you know, against the monarchs started in California, basically, much as Gather did. And Gather, people in Gather were very tight with a lot of the Chinese nationalists and stuff. So um, I don't know specifically about natives and African-Americans, but certainly, and and I think Pashara can speak to this with Sohan Singh Bakna, they, and, you know, this was, he, he and the organization very much had an internationalist outlook about, you know, they weren't just fighting for Indian rights. They were fighting for the rights of people like themselves across yeah. the world. Yeah, thank you. That's, I, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Indians. <laughs> thank you very much. Jane, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, I am so fascinated by this history that you've presented. It's just so amazing. It's so interesting to me that the gutter movement um, had so much origins in Oregon. I mean, it's just, and then they went back to um, India and were so persecuted by their own people and killed and so forth. But it's it's amazing that the inception was here. And I just, I just find, I'm so glad we know about that now, but I'm continually lamenting and this, this kind, kind of, my question comes from your article, Joe, about what have we lost for not embracing the culture of Indians uh, here early on and all of the other cultures we decimated here in the United States, which brings me to think, I wonder what Pashara's poetry is like, and I don't necessarily want to put you on the spot, but that's the art of it all, is some of what we've really lost by not, um, embracing uh, people who have come to this country to get freedom from oppression. And here we are, have oppressed so many cultures. So Prashara, do you have poetry in English? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I write in Punjabi. I was afraid of that. <laughs> okay. Well, that was kind of my question. And I, I just want to thank you all so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you. Pishara, wasn't one of your uh, poems translated to English? Um, I think uh, um, all the ones which are on the slide, uh, video slide show, they have the English uh, subtitles, which uh, my son has helped uh, uh, doing that. Uh, but they, they have, um, if you go on the website and look at the, um, what is on the video slide shows, they, they all have uh, English subtitles. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. But I write in basically in, in Punjabi because that is uh, the language I think. I suspected that. <laughs> but most of my work is um, has uh, uh, English subtitles. Uh, if you go to okay. my thank you, Bashara, I have a question for you, sir. Um, so you you were living with heroes um when did that dawn on you and how how did it make you feel to realize that that these dear people were such heroes that is a that is a great question uh, donna and um I'm afraid I, you know, when I lived with them, I they just uh, were like, uh, you know, grandparents for me. Um, even, you know, uh, when I was a child and uh, uh, we lived um, 
you know, his land and uh, this Kirti Khan uh, ashram where we lived, uh, called Babi the Dera, was uh, about a mile uh, or uh, three quarters of a mile from the village because that is where he he donated his uh, house in the village and made this new settlement uh, where, where he could, you know, uh, uh, have those people, uh, all those uh, activists, you know, come and go. Uh, he kept um, his activity going. Um, so uh, when I was there, uh, he, he used to ask me to go to the village and uh, get a newspaper for, for him, which some, sometimes I, I wouldn't go, I would refuse because that was the time to play uh, in the in 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 the in, in the with, with other children, and um, and and later you know I realized that um, you know these are these are not normal uh, uh, grandparents. There is something more. But that was only when I went to the high school and we started uh, getting into these poetry sessions, and then we started uh, 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 hearing uh, listening him very closely. Uh, but that was. Um, I was in my um, teens, uh, really, yeah, after 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes, you know, it's like when you lose your parents and then you realize that, you know, how good they were. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and while they were there, uh, most of the time, you don't really understand their fully uh, what they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I could have, when I look back, I feel that uh, I could have uh, got more from them. I could have asked more questions. I could have learned more from them, uh, what went on in their lives. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, it didn't uh, really uh, dawn that much uh, to me. Yeah. But still, I feel I was very fortunate that I had that opportunity uh, to see them uh, that close. Do we have any more questions this evening? I don't have a question so much as an observation. Um, when I was listening to the story, I was thinking about the classic hero's journey. And in general, when we are listening to or, or experiencing a hero's journey, we are identifying with the heroes. And I'm sitting here in my house in St. John's thinking I'm on the villain side of this hero's journey. <laughs> I am in the neighborhood that was the villain for this particular story and and I'm having very conflicted feelings about it. On the one hand, of course, it it feels like a very shameful part of St. John's past. But at the same time, I can't help but feel a tiny flicker of pride <laughs> that this catalyst of this horrible event here had such terrific repercussions for for people everywhere. And I just, I find that I'm feeling, um, I'm having very complicated and conflicted thoughts about the whole thing. One of the guest editors for the Oregon Historical Quarterly's uh, issue about white supremacy that came out in winter of 2019, and I encourage everybody to get it and read it. It's a brilliant piece of work. Um, one of the co-editors made this very smart statement, and um, he said, we're not responsible for history, but we're responsible for our relationship to it. And I, I find that a really helpful guide. Mm -hmm. This is truly amazing history. Mm -hmm. I think too, people's concern about not knowing it, it's, you know, there, I think that's a whole nother important question to grapple with is like, how does that happen? How is something, especially in a story like this that people have spoken to from different angles here tonight, 
it's a momentous struggle. I mean, story. So like, how in the hell did this happen? You know, that we don't know it. And I think, I think we really need to think about the whole question of how class and racial supremacy molds the history that we know. And, and that's why critical race theory is such a thing right now in terms of because people knowing you ask what's lost about when you don't know this history you don't know about alliances that happened you don't know about the tremendous things people have done you don't think about like what you asked Anna about how would our lives look different if you know we had not driven people out or done x y and z and I think this whole process of how white supremacy and class supremacy operates in terms of robbing us of history is, is one can understand why it's a battle line today. And I think that we need to actively engage on that, so. Well, I very much hope that the commemoration of the St. John's riot does come to pass. Um, I would absolutely be in attendance for that and, um, this, this incredible history deserves to be spotlighted in the city of Portland and in Oregon. It's such an important part of our story, our collective story. And um, I, I hope that, that we get to see that happen. Well, I won't just ask you to attend, we'll ask you to help make it happen. So fair Absolutely. to everyone. <laughs> Count me in. I'm in. <laughs> and I know some of my neighbors are here tonight and we are definitely in to make this happen. I wish I, I wish Donna and those people, wherever they are, able to look down uh, uh, here on earth and see what, uh, what you know, the St. Johnians and the people of Oregon and Australians and you guys are doing for them. Uh, I think that will be incredible. Uh, if they had a, some way of uh, knowing how they are being remembered now and how their legacy is being uh, remembered, I think that would be, uh, you know, uh, beyond their wildest imagination mm -hmm. that uh, the, uh, the St. John will come and Oregon Oregonians will come that far. Mary Ann shared that one action we can all take uh, from this event this evening is that we can push to change the way we teach history in this country. And she points out that many of us were taught propaganda instead of the truth. And, and that is absolutely something that each of us can do in our own school districts is to push for this history to be taught. The reason I asked for a copy of the chat earlier, I didn't know I could save it. I did I'm trying that. I've been trying to do, do that for the past three years. It's just not happening. And I was mm -hmm. thinking, if I take this chat with me and prove to our, even to our, our you know, um, people who sit in the Capitol, you know, hey, you know, people want to change the way you teach history. And, and you know, I need you to work with me on this. Uh, so maybe that'll happen. So, you know, hopefully we're trying that and um, I, think, I think we can all, if we all try that together versus one person, uh, it'll change things. Bernadette? I just noticed something about a virtual tour, Joanna. Could you please tell us what that is? Um, Priyash could. Oh yeah, um, a while back, right before the pandemic, they were gonna do an event in St. John's um, about the riot. And part of that was gonna be a walking tour, but there's a potential virtual tour too that we talked about, but you know, since then people kind of stopped gathering and organizing around that. So hopefully that will resume soon. I know a lot of us have had yeah. pretty wild lives since then, so. Yeah, sometime soon, hopefully. And that opening slide where the street is the painted 
uh, text on the street. Where is that exactly? Is it a real street? Yeah, was was it on Richmond? It was just off the downtown during the BLM protests in 2020. And it meant that whoever did that was definitely paying attention to what was going on, you know, and reading and stuff. It was great. I was so excited. Yes. It was that um, mural that went about two or three blocks long. Yes, um, I, I can answer that question. Uh, that painting was on Edison Street near the intersection with Richmond in front of the Edison Street Community Garden. Yes. Unfortunately, it is now paved over. Oh. However, word in the neighborhood is that the person who created that installation was planning on recreating it after the city finished that project. So I do hope that that happens. I, I haven't had an update on that, but the city has now completed their work on that block. Tell them I'll help buy paint. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Ann has her hand up too. I just wanted to add a quick comment. I know I work at Portland Community College and one of the big things we're talking about is decolonizing the, the curriculum. Yeah. Like I teach ESOL, English as a second language. So all my students are refugees, immigrants from all around the world. And we are teaching other things like providing um, stories by BIPOC authors. Or for example, I teach the real history. I talk about the myth of Thanksgiving and the real story. And I share a video of Native Americans, one word, what they what Thanksgiving means to them. So it's just an example of, we have a lot of work to do, but and I know it's not a new thing. Some people in education probably have heard this, whether K through 12 or in college, about decolonize the curriculum. Yeah. Yes, thank you. People, people are doing a lot of terrific work and thank you for yours. And I think that's why, you know, people are a little freaked out about it, you know, because <laughs> it's not because it's not going on, it's exactly because it is going on and somebody's trying to stuff that genie back in the, the hat, you know. Navni, can you tell me what kinds of barriers you're running into in Salem about inclusive history? Because I thought they were supposed to be trying to make state curriculum more inclusive. Are they backing down from that now? Uh, well, I have talked to various um, senators that I thought I had like a good, <laughs> good relationship with, but what I hear is that it's not going to be a piece of cake. It'll take time, and it's been three years. And I've spoken to the um, head of the I don't know what, what, his, uh, what his designation is at the um, education department. Uh, and I've spoken to him and sent emails after emails, but I haven't heard back. Uh, Market, he's an Indian too, by the way. <laughs> I think second or third generation. It's just not happening. This, it's just one obstacle after the other. I get something done, I step forward and I do this amount of work. And then I meet with like, oh, it's not gonna happen this, this year, maybe next year. And then next year it's forgotten. It's a, it's just a never ending struggle. Um, you don't think it's part of the trying to stop critical race theory and all history that is non-white. You think it's just an ongoing Oregonian resistance to having some history. That's what your take of this is? Your I have understanding to believe is? that. I don't know what else to think, you know? Um, I know I was very, 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 positive and I had like I was very optimistic when I uh, heard about the three years ago and think the inclusion of um, Holocaust uh, in the in our syllabus is the uh, high school and I was very uh, optimistic that this will probably happen but it didn't it just didn't so now I, from, from the, um, our, our legislators to, uh, I've moved on to the education um, department and I'm hoping that they will probably listen. But going there doesn't mean that every school district will adopt it. It has to be accepted at a higher level, you know. Uh, 
um, level above that. Uh, and that's just not happening. I, I just don't know. Maybe, as I said, I'm the only person working for it at the moment. So maybe if we join hands and if I, if I have more people with me, maybe they'll listen better. And that is a wonderful place for us to bring our meeting to a close. Um, I wish to extend our very sincere thanks to our speakers this evening. This was an absolutely wonderful event. I'm blown away. I've learned so much. I have so much to think about. Um, we really appreciate your time and your generous sharing. Thank you so much to everyone who came this evening. Yeah. And uh, please look for the video that will be uploaded to YouTube. And we will look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you so much for your support.